Ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute privilege to welcome you to our upcoming August 26th, 27th, and 28th Premier Firearms Auction. As usual, uh, I'm going down my exercise in futility, doing my top 10. Essentially, we're taking half of 1% of the entire auction, um, and I rank them 1 through 10. It's really my pick, so it's very subjective. It's very difficult. Um, I loathe it, and I love it all at the same time. Um, but let's let's get right into it. We have an exciting sale. You might know I'm, I'm usually particular to 19th century American firearms. This is a departure from that. Uh, number 10 on my list is the Fermo Fricasse engraved Renzini. Now, I had the, the privilege and the pleasure of, of picking this gun up myself um, and, and got to meet with the family uh, of, the, of the collector. And each of these experiences are, of course, different. Um, and what a gun room they had, great people. And seeing this gun amongst other great guns, it's what I'm looking for in this top 10, what I look for in every auction is the elite. There's a lot of good, there's few great, and then elite separates, separates it all. And so I'm, I'm looking for what I can identify as the lead. And I've never seen uh, in, in the hand um, a Fracassi uh, engraved gun. And so seeing it from 20 feet away stands right out. Um, and, then, and then being in the presence of it um, is, is pretty special. Um, so talent's, talent's different and talent's interesting. And I, I kind of wrote about it in our About This Auction, but you can put a lot of hard work and create talent, and some of this talent is God-given. And and what Firmo Fricasse has here, it's it's a it's a God-given talent, um, meant to do exactly what he's doing um, in engraving the finest 21st century engraver uh, by a long shot, in my opinion, even amongst the greats. And I and I think you know less is more. The less I say, um, and and the more the more visual we show um, of this gun, the better. So I'll I'll refrain from from picking it up. Uh, and, and moving it around and just let the stills and the photography speak for itself because it is it is totally elite for what it is. One of the finest engraved firearms I've ever inspected in the hand. Uh, in my opinion, the finest shotgun uh, that we've ever sold. And I, I have it on good authority from, as far as I know, the, the largest collector uh, and the most knowledgeable collector on best quality guns who's saying, Rosini makes the best gun, period. So you have the finest engraver in the 21st century on the best product available, number 10 on my list. Number nine on my list, I'm cheating already, two guns here, um, but they relate, trust me. We have a factory engraved deluxe Colt 1877 Lightning. This is the medium frame, and of course a Winchester uh, factory engraved 1866. So I really want the focus uh, of the number nine to be on the Colt. Um, so let's let's get to it. So uh, the factory engraved lightnings are, are super rare. So between the small frame and the medium frame, medium frame, they engraved 40 guns, factory engraved 40 guns. And of the, the small frame guns, approximately 20 or 22, I think it varies um, depending on the account. So you're looking at 60 guns that were actually manufactured between the, the medium frame uh, carbine, and the small frame that were actually factory engraved. And what you'll see is a lot of these guns are referred to as Spalding guns um, that were actually shipped to, to Spalding and Company in Chicago. And, and they're they're kind of a departure, um, honestly, from factory engraved Colts, especially of the era where you see this like heavy oak leaf um, influence within the engraving itself, oak leaf and vine, oak leaf and grapes. Um, and, and that's why those guns are automatically kind of a typically called, hey, a Spalding gun. Um, because so many of them predominantly went went to Spalding and Company. So, diving into this gun's different. Okay, this gun this gun never left Hartford. It stayed in Hartford. In fact, it's consigned um, right out of Hartford. So, on the surface, of course, you see uh, factory engraved the oak leaves and vines grapes. Uh, it's got a sycamore stock, which is a special order feature, twenty six inch, forty four forty, half octagon, half round. Um, it letters as gold trim, which would be a feature on the butt plate. Um, as well as on the trigger guard itself, uh, a factory engraving, of course, again, it's, it stayed in Hartford. And so, but what makes this gun special is not only its configuration, not only its, its rarity, but what stands out to me is the panel scene on the, on the right hand side of this gun, uh, which is a bear, uh, it, definitely a departure from what you see in these lightnings, you know, so the most well-known celebrated, heavily embellished, 
uh, lightning is the Kickapoo medicine gun. If you've if you've seen Colt engraving, it's gonna it's gonna stand out to you um, like a sore thumb. It's a uh, it's a it's elite gold inlaid. You name it um, in condition. That's probably the most well known heavily embellished lightning. And but you don't see panel scene guns. So this is this has uh, another degree to it. And well, how does it relate to to the Winchester? So this is a thirty eight thousand range Winchester eighteen sixty six. Okay. Factory engraved and signed by John Ulrich. So that's one of the beautiful blocks that you want to see within the within the Winchester 1866. It's for factory engraved. You got 36,000 range, 38,000 range, so on and so forth, up to 97, 100,000, 120. They engraved them in blocks. Now, the 38,000 block is, of course, early. So right under the stock, we have the early rendition of John Ulrich's signature, JU on the wrist. And it's a classic early example of John Ulrich factory engraving um, sans the panel scene on the left-hand side. As far as we know, uh, as far as I know, as far as we can research, this is the only example of a, of a really deluxe custom treatment. So you have a brass frame, which is silver plated. Okay. And that's where, when you, when you start seeing the, the brass come through the silver, that's, you have wear and it's enough to keep it honest, but you can see it. What, what's difficult is this oval here, right in the center, right on the left-hand side um, of the gun itself. From the, the naked eye would say, it was worn, it was polished, but it was silver and now it's brass. That's not the case. This gun was gilt. Um, so you have brass, silver, this was left exposed and gilt. And in the right light, it stands out, it shines, it shimmers, it's unmistakable. There's still original gilding um, in the engraving. I can see it perfectly from my angle here. So this gun is this gun is very special as a factory engraved John Ulrich sign, the only example of a silver plated and gilt. Um, obviously, it's a very delicate process and quite frankly, probably too difficult, probably too expensive. And that, that gilding's so thin and so delicate that it just, it flakes off, but you can still see it in the sheltered areas. Again, Kevin, what does that have to do? Well, if you know anything about John Ulrich and the Ulrich family, uh, probably the greatest in engraving dynasty of, of the 19th century, uh, John and his brother Conrad particularly, they have classic motifs. And, and one of John's signatures that you'll see on Winchester's um, such as what really stands out to me is the Granville Stewart 76, which we uh, proudly sold several, several years ago, um, is this bear. Called a brown bear, called a grizzly bear, whatever you want to call it, uh, John Ulrich used that bear almost as a signature in and of itself. Um, and that's what we see on the right-hand side of this gun. And if, if you've seen that on other of his Winchester works, again, it's, it's unmistakable. So uh, whether people know this or, or don't know this, the Ulrichs actually started with Colt. Um, and it wasn't until the 1870s that the Ulrichs uh, start cutting for Winchester almost exclusively, but they, they did start at Colt. So there's, there's a precedent for that. And, you know, I, I go to the farmer's insurance commercial. We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. And if you've seen a factory engraved Winchester by John Ulrich and you see that bear, you can't, th there will not be anybody on God's green earth that can convince me that that is not his work on the right hand side um, of, of this Colt medium frame deluxe lightning rifle. And so we have an early work by John Ulrich and what, what I, again, it would take, <laughs> I would need a photograph of the guy cutting it to tell me this was not John Ulrich because it's not just the bear, but it's also the use um, of the ground underneath it. And I'll reference two guns. They're both in the original uh, Winchester engraving book uh, by Wilson. They're ink pulls. Uh, one's a flat side Winchester 1895. And one is a, a, a Winchester 1910 semi-automatic rifle. And they both feature identical oak leaf patterns um, and identical game scenes. So there's a precedent for John Ulrich, factory signed, factory engraved work in a 95 flat side in 1910. And here we are, um, this is 1906. We're right in the same time frame. Um, again, you, you, won't, you won't convince me otherwise. Taking it a step further, this gun's got great history. Um, I hope you get a chance to read about it in the catalog where it came from. I mean, this stayed in Hartford. It was the pride of the, of a, of the family's collection. Uh, when the gentleman who owned it passed, he actually hid it in the wall in his kitchen. Um, and his family was lucky enough to find it, but it was his pride and joy. Uh, and here, and you know, here it is again, it's factory engraved, uh, gold trim, deluxe sycamore stock, letters to a T, 
uh, with a factory engraved John Ulrich signed early 38,000 range Winchester 1866, number nine on my list. Number eight on my list is this absolutely phenomenal. And when I say phenomenal, I'm speaking purely and strictly as an art object. Uh, Schuyler Hartley and Graham uh, statue hilt presentation sword. Uh, this sword has history in and of itself that 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 puts it in that rarefied category of of elite. Uh, but first, I just I kind of want to just speak to the sword as as an art object. Um, uh, American decorative arts. This goes back to their 1861 catalog. Uh, it's listed as object number 437. Rich presentation swords. Um, Lady Liberty, and I think when I, when I say a lead, it's something that, that makes you have an experience, um, and this sword certainly made me have an experience the first time I saw it. Uh, jaw dropping stops you in its tracks. Um, it's one thing to see a photograph of something this beautiful, this gorgeous, it's a whole another experience, like I said, to, to hold it in your hands um, and to see it, but it's, it's Lady Liberty, Again, and, it, and it's three-dimensional. Um, so you have Lady Liberty uh, in full regalia, full armor, uh, holding a sword, and and I think you know three dimensions is the best way to put it because you can you can see all around. So you have gilt brass, uh, silver. It's chiseled. It's chased, and it's the condition of it's phenomenal. It's actually one of three or four really important swords that we have within within the auction itself. It's my personal favorite, it's not the most expensive. Uh, we have General Burnside sword, uh, for example, but what really grabbed me on the sword was, was how beautiful it is, again, strictly as an, as an art object. Uh, it was presented to Captain Israel Smith of the 10th Michigan Cavalry, who distinguished himself uh, Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, and Gettysburg, uh, as, as, well as, as well as other uh, very famous battles, but I don't, I don't think it's bigger than, than Gettysburg. So in and of itself, you have the history, uh, you know, his men, a famous quote about Gen or Captain Smith was, he's got the fight in him, um, a man's man, uh, a man's general, respected by his men, obviously enough to, to present him with such a wonderful, wonderful piece of art. Um, and it's cased, which is, which is super rare. I think a lot of these were actually, you know, when they would have been originally purchased, they would have been cased. Um, but to still be with its original case, to have the condition, to have the history, and oh, by the way, to be epic. Uh, for an art object, that's why it's number eight on my list. Number seven on my list, you talk about cheating. Um, <laughs> where do we start? Here's the thing. Um, we try to, each auction kind of presents its own opportunities, uh, given the, the collections that we, we have the opportunity to market and sell. And this is a first or it's a best. This is the finest grouping of first-generation Colt single actions to ever hit the market. Uh, it's the finest grouping of first-generation Colt single actions to ever come to auction. And we say that from experience. Uh, we would say previously that the next best group to come up for auction at one time would have been uh, the Gateway Collection, um, where you had tons of rarity, tons of quality, um, in, in huge numbers. And... What we have, we have that same thing happening, you know, August 26th, 27th, and 28th, but the, the quality of it is simply outrageous. The depth of it is like we've never seen before. And so I kind of want to talk about all these. I want to talk about none of these, if that makes sense, because the, the, the rarity and the condition is, again, it's just, it's, it's like nothing we've seen before. So, you know, the most iconic 19th century American firearm, the Colt single action, uh, for first generation, they made 357, 859. That's the number that's always quoted. That's 357, 859. That's how many first generation single actions were manufactured. Now, many of those have been lost to time and space and fires and natural disasters and rode hard and put away wet. And so it's nice to be able to quantify and qualify rarity for such an iconic American firearm. It is baseball. It is apple pie. Uh, it's as Americana as it gets, the Colt single action army. Um, so just to, you know, here, here's what we have. I mean, we have flat top, 450 Ely, one of 160 made. We have another flat top target, uh, and that has the elongated grip, oh, by the way. Another flat top target on my left. 
uh, and this one's in 22 rimfire. They made a hundred of them. We have a, a factory cased 476 Ely, um, approximately a hundred made. Uh, and look at the quality, look at the condition. Big fat front sight with a factory case, actually a factory presentation case. Seven and a half inch blue case hardened, gorgeous black powder, first generation single action with an original skeleton shoulder stock. I mean, you can you can essentially count on one hand how many original skeleton shoulder stocks are available uh, on the market, all on one table. Uh, we have, you want to talk martially inspected cavalries? How about from Ainsworth, Nettleton? We have lot six guns, uh, DFC. I'll introduce you to, to an RAC later on um, in the countdown, but it's it's an overwhelming quality, overwhelming rarity, uh, and overwhelming quantity. And th that's what we have here. Factory embellished stuff. Let's talk about George Gamble. Um, if you're not familiar with, with uh, George Gamble's collection, specifically after the last auction, you, you, you should be. Um, but, you know, George, George donated several absolutely magnificent firearms to the Gene Autry Museum. If, you're, if you ever find yourself, as I said last time, uh, in Orange County with, with something to do, go see the Gene Autry Museum. Go see George Gamble's collection that he's donated to that institution. It's, it's jaw-dropping. Uh, the presentation uh, root set, the Elijah K. root set, one of the most famous, probably the most famous uh, percussion Colt set is there. Uh, Meads, Remingtons, it, it goes on and on. A gold uh, Winchester 1876 we sold in 2008 out of, out of John Fielder's collection. How about, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, 1876, Teddy Roosevelt's single action. That's George Gamble's collection. There are two guns on this table out of Mr. Gamble's collection, one being this Glon uh, five and a half inch carved ivory grip single action here. And up front to the left, just you want to talk about a, a single gun collection. How about a C engraved Glon Bisley that's the best of the best. And that's, again, George Gamble, George Gamble. The two guns that I would say, if I was going to focus on any on the table, that's why I want to talk about all of them and none of them. Uh, the gun center to my left is 45 ACP. This is not chambered in 45 long colt. This is chambered in 45 ACP. They made 44 first generation single actions chambered in 45 ACP, 44 of them. Uh, most of them went to, to servicemen. They had an unlimited supply of ammunition. Um, they were road hard and put away wet. They're hard to identify. They're hard to letter, um, let alone to find one in absolutely pristine condition. That's what I'm talking about. And the bell, the ball for me, especially in this group, um, not speaking as the auction of a whole, because how do you compare uh, a mint C engraved Bisley to anything else? But the bell, the ball here is the is the smooth bore. Okay, seven and a half inch blue case hardened, factory ivory grips. They made sixteen. Again, they made 16 first-generation smoothbore single actions. And you you talk about condition. This speaks volume to everything that I'm kind of babbling about, but it's absolutely mint. One of 16, it's the, it's the best of the best. We've only sold two. This is the second one we've sold. We sold a world beater for a, uh, a smoothbore um, two, two years ago, a year and a half ago. And, and this is just as good as it gets for any caliber, let alone a 4440 40 smooth bore. Um, so like I said, without fear of contradiction, the finest grouping of first generation Colt single actions has ever come to market. I kind of put them as number seven on my list just to show you the variety. And oh, by the way, for every one that's represented here on the table, I could have put two more on here. So it was, it was really difficult um, to pick and choose, but just wanted to show uh, the depth, the breadth, the quality, the rarity. It's all here. Number seven on my list. Number six on my list, another group of guns. Sorry, not sorry. I don't know how you pick one. That's my issue. Um, two iconic collections here. We have the Mac McCroskey collection, and again, the George Gamble collection represented on this table. And so we've, Mr. McCroskey's collection needs no introduction and typically we'll associate it with Winchesters. Okay, we know that's not the case. We've sold <laughs> Patterson's, uh, 60 armies, incredible Colts uh, for Mr. McCroskey. The only case hard in Winchester of all, on and on, on and on. McCroskey, he was a, it's a first ballot Hall of Famer, Mount Rushmore collector, and he was a great Smith & Wesson collector. And it's it's great to, to, to show that here. Um, and then, of course, George Campbell. But diving in, I, I just kind of, I'm, I'm just going to start over here. 
Smith and Wesson number two army. This is LD Nimshki engraved. And what sets it apart outside of its condition is its silver bands. So it's the only example that I've ever seen. 19th century um, Smith and Wessons, antique Smith and Wessons, true pre-1898 stuff. That that's always been my passion. Um, never seen a silver banded number two army. And like you can see it here on the on on the barrel where it meets the frame, but it's it's just taken on that really handsome dark and dark and dark and patina. Uh, but you know, Nimshi at his finest, condition, condition, condition like crazy. Interestingly enough, it has a EA on the underside of the barrel here. We'll probably get a close-up of it. Also, it's silver banded like you'd assume on a 1-1000, but silver banded at the muzzle, but it has EA. Um, and then I just wanna, I wanna show you the inside of the case because it's exceptional, but it has this really cool old black box of cartridges. I've never seen it before. That doesn't mean much, um, but it's Ethan Allen. It's a, it's a really rare, again, I've never seen it, black, black and green cartridge box. It says Ethan Allen on it. We looked and you know it's hard it's hard not to say that there's a connection there uh, that this this very well could be Ethan Allen's um, number two army. It certainly is special. It's certainly in high condition. The uh, the cartridge box speaks volumes to that. We we couldn't connect the dots, but it's certainly there. Regardless, as it's a premier gun. Um, let's bounce to the Remington Smoot. This is George out of George Gamble's collection, and it's really just like it's a piece of jewelry. Um, plated guns aren't necessarily for everybody, but I, I think it, it particularly works here. Um, full gold, mother of pearl grips, and then again the case is the case is spectacular. Uh, uh, leather case, beautiful silk lined, kind of what you'd assume from like Hartley and Graham. They'd see on Smith and Wessons again silk lined. What I would associate with with uh, Hartley and Graham. But a beautiful Remington Smoot. As far as I'm concerned, it's the finest Remington Smoot there is. Um, and then talking about another number two army again. This is out of Mac McCroskey's collection. This is a famous gun. It's also LD Nimshi engraved. Um, condition, condition, condition. I want to show you the left-hand side. I don't know if we're going to get it on film or we'll get a close-up on it. But there's a panel scene on the left side of a Zouav. Um, charging, uh, bayonet fixed, and you know this is right out of the out of Nimshki's pull book, right out of the ink pull book. Just a, such a cool scene. You have one of those aha moments. You study the pull book, and then you actually you know get to see it on that gun, uh, silver plated, uh, gold washed, mother of pearl grips. I have to I have to talk about the case again. Um, we're going to talk about every case on this table because there's something that I have never seen before on this case. So as found. And you, you, know, you see it in Colt collecting where accessories get upgraded and high graded, um, cases get relined as they get damaged over time. This case is as found. Um, I'm not gonna pull it out. We'll probably do a demonstration again um, using the, a photograph, but on Smith & Wesson cases, you'll see this hole in the front of the case at the lip um, where, it, where it meets uh, the bottom of the case. There's always a little hole there. And I've never known, I never knew what that hole was. Uh, lo and behold, we have the original string that's tied through the hole with the key on it. So to me, it would be the retailer. Um, they didn't want to lock the case. They didn't want to lose the keys. They ran, they ran string and rope through those. I've never seen that before. I don't know that there's another gun with that. I just, I think it's the, it's the neatest thing. And it speaks volumes that this thing is just an absolute time capsule. Um, it's embossed on the grip. I mean, this thing is all there. It's a super important gun, beautiful gun. Um, again, it's out of the McCroskey collection. That's the quality that we have here. And then the last gun is like, you know, kind of like my pound for pound pick in the sale. If I had to pick one gun on the table, I would say this is truly the number six. Um, Smith & Wesson, first model, second issue. It's engraved by Gustav Young. Uh, it's blue, it's gilt, mother of pearl grips. And it's just, it's really classic and elegant. Um, Young's own hand and just some telltale signs. You know, we have the face on the on the left hand side here. Uh, again, that's gilt. And then the animal head scroll here on the left at the barrel, um, flipping it around. Same thing. We have two of the animal heads here, one on the frame, one at the barrel. Again, you see that contrasting combination finish, gold, gilt. Um, this thing just speaks and speaks and speaks. Flipping it around, I want to I want to show the back of the hammer. Just 
it's it's slight, but it's so elegant. Um, that engraving on the back of the hammer, that's case hardened. It's just, it's so rich, it's so beautiful. Um, and it's like, we cautiously don't use the word mint um, because there's really no such thing as a perfect gun. Um, that's, that's really as close as it gets. And while we've talked about every case on the table, never seen this before again, doesn't really mean anything. Um, but this is what I would consider like a bookcase. We, we, I think we struggled with it in the catalog a little bit, but I would consider this a bookcase. Um, I remember seeing this for the first time, but uh, if we get it in the right light, we can see that the it's just kind of crazed on the top. Um, you get that like alligator cracking um, on the top of that lacquer. And I'll open it up. Just a gorgeous, just a, I mean, the case in and of itself is gorgeous. Beautiful, like dark, rich blue lining, you know, screws, re replacement screws, like you'd want to see if you bought this thing new. Again, also uh, alligator crazed um, on it, but I've never seen, you know, you see those those Samuel Colt present book cases. Um, this is what I would mostly consider, most definitely consider a book case. Never seen one of those before. So that's the depth of the Smith & Wessons, of this Remington Smoot. What a great table they make. Any one of these could be number six. I went, I went here, but number six on my list, four great guns from two icons. Number five on my list, no one's a stranger to a Winchester 1894, but you've probably never seen one like this. Um, 1928, Winchester makes its one millionth Winchester 1894, and then by 1983, they're well past five million. It's the most, you know, it's the most popular, uh, most produced lever action rifle made. Um, iconic, absolutely iconic. And there's a lot to unpack on this gun, which is why it's five on my list. Uh, con configuration, configuration, configuration. That's what we collect when we look at uh, Winchesters, whether it's standard grade, whether it's heavily embellished guns, anything in between, we're looking at configurations to break down the rarity. And I have to imagine we're looking at, at a one of one just to break down the configuration. It's it, it's not in a letterable range. That's the, that's the unfortunate thing. So sorry, not sorry. I'm not going to apologize for it. It's just it's what it is. It does not letter. It won't letter. It's not in a letterable range. Uh, but hooded front side, express rear peep on the tang, half octagon, half round, takedown, shotgun butt, double set triggers, carved D wood. It's not just deluxe. It is carved D wood, factory engraved, John Ulrich signed. Lastly, most importantly, it's factory gold inlaid. Um, so from a configuration perspective, <laughs> again, one of one. It's also a presentation gun. It's got history. Uh, some people know it as the Rutledge gun. It's got great Texas history. George Rutledge was a executive with the El Paso Railroad. Uh, it was presented to him by the mayor of El Paso, and it's memorialized here uh, on the right-hand side of the frame. I'm going to flip it around uh, to show you the the other side, which is the uh, game scene engraving. Classic Ulrich scene of two bull elk, uh, hunter behind the tree. Again, plated in gold. It's John Ulrich signed. Uh, not sure if I mentioned that on, on the lower tang. And here's, here's where we separate the men from the boys. Uh, a factory gold inlay barreled band. Uh, here, here at the barrel, gold is good whether it's it's a plated frame um, or whether it's a a gold inlay on the frame or a gold lit inlay on the barrel. It takes it to the next level. I don't know. You know, we've sold five factory gold inlaid Winchester 1894s. Um, that's where that puts this gun. Let alone uh, with Texas history. I mean, come on, Texas history and uh, condition, 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 and just like in the last video. Uh, so this gun originally came out of the Mac McCroskey collection. So you have exceptional Texas history, great collecting provenance in terms of configuration rarity. You can't beat it and condition. Uh, it's out of this world. It's, it's pound for pound. One of the best Winchesters in the sale, probably one of the best Winchesters will offer all year. Number five on my list. Number four on my list, high art European, early 19th century, 
the art of the gun, gun making as an art, the embodiment of a steel canvas, starting with the case in and of itself uh, as a work of art. Uh, German silver inlaid, engraved, beautiful, carved, uh, and then <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Um, sensational, when we talk about, again, the art of the gun, gun making as an art where each individual craft requires uh, mastering in and of itself. Barrel making, inlaying, engraving, polishing, carving. Um, that's that's exactly what we have here. Precious metal uh, throughout, from the barrel um, onto the frame. Gold, silver, mother of pearl. The quality uh, of the carving itself. Out of the Robert M. Lee collection, and by tradition, uh, these pistols were presented to the King of Hanover. Um, the maker is Morgan Roth. It's a, it's a Prussian maker. Um, but again, you see everything from gold, silver, mother of pearl, ivory throughout. And, and oh, by the way, it's a pair. Uh, you know, it's almost like less words, the better. And that was kind of our approach on this for, for the cataloging. Uh, you have to see these to believe it because the quality is outrageous. And they're, you know, they're, they're time capsules. They are, they are totally time capsules. They are like the day that they were presented. Um, as good as it gets for, for high art European, you know, you'll see dueling, dueling pistols, target pistols. They were in vogue, of course, and different levels of embellishment. Yes, sir. But of this quality exhibition quality to the nth degree, no doubt regal presentations. And that's why by tradition to the King of Hanover and, um, no question about it. They're just, they're as good as it gets. And that's why they're number four on my list. Ladies and gentlemen, number three on my list uh, for the second time in an auction, in two auctions, and for the second time um, in my career, uh, have the ability to examine both a 1 in 100 and a 1 in 1,000 Winchester 1873. Just kind of goes to show you how lucky and blessed we are at Rock Island Auction uh, to have the opportunity to handle the best of the best. Uh, and that's what we have here because for rarity, for Winchesters, one of one thousands, one of one hundreds sit at, at, at the very top, the absolute pinnacle, um, and to have two side by side, and to also have two that are uh, rather similar um, for for configuration for finish is astounding. Um, and I don't really know which one to start with first. I'll start with the one of one hundred up front. We have history with this gun. It's a very well known gun. It's a famous gun. Um, all the way back to when the gun was originally purchased, we have uh, we have the provenance on this gun up to 1950. Bob Abel's Bob Abel's had this, and I think his auction catalog number 31. Uh, one of our clients, one of our friends, was uh, uh, fortunate to to alert us and say, "Hey, I got the Bob Abel's catalog. I couldn't find a date on the catalog. I think it's 1950 or 1951 uh, when he was when he's marketing this one 100. And keep in mind, he was selling it for $3,500." Um, yeah, so this stuff's always been coveted. It's always been prized. Um, and you know, between the one one thousands, both, both these are first models. Um, the one one hundreds, they made eight, they're six ID. We sold one last auction. <laughs> here's, here's the next, um, configuration, nickel frame, straight grip, Deluxe. The nickel frame's probably the 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 feature that sets it apart. Um, it's photographed in uh, Mattis's book. It's photographed in Gordon's book. It's photographed in Lewis's book. Um, it's a very very well known gun. And for a one in one hundred, this these are the generational guns. Okay, these are the guns that 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 come out and they you you don't get another shot at them. Um, we sold this gun in two thousand and eight out of the John Fielder collection and. I mean, you, you count your lucky stars to be able to to have a, a shot um, at a 1 in 100 within your collecting career. I mean, you think of all the great Winchester collections that are actively being built right now. How many of these opportunities will you get um, in your collecting career? So that's what this 1 in 100 represents. One of, one of eight made, one of six known. That's your shot. There's your opportunity. And then right behind it, one in 1,000. Also, you know, they look like twins. Uh, nickel frame. What 
There's two, the barrel is what the barrel is what makes this gun elite on the one one thousand. One, it's the only thirty two inch one one thousand that I could find in the ledgers. Uh, you look at Lewis's book and you look at Gordon's book, where they they, they actually list the ledgers. This there's no thirty two inch gun. Okay, this is this is the only game in town. Um, nickel frame, silver banded, gold inlaid. Okay. <laughs> So we, we looked, number five on my list was that 94, gold inlaid on the barrel. You have a factory gold inlaid uh, Winchester 1873 1 in 1000 here. Uh, Peter, Peter Fleck of Houston. This is a gun, it's in Ed Lewis's book and it's kind of like uh, meeting your hero. You know, you, you, see, you study the books and you, and you love the books and you live the books and not knowing where these guns are and then getting to, getting to hold it and examine it in your hand is like, you know, meeting your hero and it, it sounds cheesy it sounds silly but that's kind of that's kind of how i feel um when we when we got to see this gun you don't know where it is it was it's it's fresh 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 so this came out of the same collection as that relief engraved winchester 1866 um the last auction this came out of the same collection as the other one 1000 that riverboat captain gun that we had last auction just a really super quiet closet texas collection um it does not letter so here's the yeah but and I, I, I would make no apologies for it. It doesn't letter as 1 in 1,000. Um, it's three numbers away from one. So this gun goes back to, to Herb Glass, Arnold Chernoff. This gun comes with letters from kind of the greats, the early greats of gun collecting, gun dealing, saying there's nothing wrong with this gun. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this gun. The only thing that there's wrong with is Winchester's record keeping, which we know. It just it it proves that. It makes you cringe. I mean... If Winchester's record keeping was better at the time, but we make no apologies for it. It is most certainly a, a one of one thousand, um, and like I said, it's backed up by Herb Glass Senior, Arnold Chernoff. Um, you just got to see it, uh, and and then the, the Peter the Peter the Peter Fleck of Houston ID. So there's actually a clip from a uh, 1877 Texas Sports a Field or Texas Sporting Field. Um, I'm misquoting the magazine, but it's it's close to that. Talking about Peter Fleck of Houston shooting a massive buck with his brand new $150 Winchester. So um, in 1877, when Winchester's marketing uh, both the 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 1873 1 100 and the 1873 1 1000, they listed the price on the 1 100 between 60 and 80 dollars, and they listed the price on the 1 100 I think between 80 and 100 or 80 and 120, and so. You have the 32 inch factory gold inlay on the barrel, hence the $150 price tag. So um, no doubt about it, it just adds further credence. But to have primary source of Peter shooting a big buck, I mean, Houston in gold on the barrel, primary source of him. And, and the quote's really great. It talks about this big buck being um, slung around his shoulders. It takes you back. And that's, that, you know, that's the greatest part about this job is to like be so close to this history and to have that primary account and, and hell, you could take this out and do the same thing with it if you wanted to today. Um, so again, <laughs> uh, we're blessed at Rock Island Auction to be given these opportunities to, to, to handle, to market, to sell um, unbelievable rarities in, in the field of 19th century uh, historic and fine arms collecting. I mean, how many opportunities do you get to stare at a 1 100, a 1 1000 side by side, like 32 inch, full mag, straight grip, deluxe, Again, they're both first models. Either one of these would be number one on many people's list. Um, number three on mine, come see it for yourself. That's what makes coming to the auction so great. You can actually do the same thing that I'm talking about doing here. So number three on my list. Number two on my list, I told you we we're gonna talk about another single action. Um, rightfully so. We use the word benchmark. Um, <laughs> the standard in which you judge similar things, right? It's, it's setting that benchmark for condition, uh, setting that benchmark for rarity, but for, for condition, for a 1890 production cavalry, for an all the way car inspected, uh, look no further, you're looking at the finest example in the world. And don't take my word for it, again, take John Kopeck's word for it. With a gold seal letter, he uses the words, uh, unbelievable, near perfect, and while there's no such thing as a perfect gun, that I, I truly believe that because the more you dig into it, this is as close as it gets. There's a, there's two casting flaws on the top of the frame. Uh, outside of that, you're looking at 
and as issued and as made and as delivered, uh, 1890, 1891 Colt single action. And it's an honor to be in its presence. I mean, at first glimpse, you're going to say, no, no way, it's refinished. Not a chance. Um, not a chance. I'm sure the internet chatter is going to be out there. But again, don't take our word for it. Take Kopech's word for it. It's, it says, it's absolutely as good as it gets. And it's just got enough wear to keep it honest. Um, this comes out of a fabulous collection. I've talked about it in previous auctions. I've talked about it in previous videos. Uh, it's, it's a collection out of Illinois. Just a, a great long time collected for 25, 30 years and put mint stuff away. Um, that's, that's what we have here. I can remember my experience seeing this gun for the first time. And so what we're, what we're looking for is original polishing lines here on the front side. I'm sure we can get that on the camera. Um, and if not, we can get that through, the, through some of the still photography that we have. Uh, polishing lines here on the grip strap both ways. Look at the grips. You talk about being able to feel something with your eyes. Those cartouches, they're puckered. Every mark on this gun is puckered. Um, just sharp, crisp, correct. You can you can really feel this gun with your eyeballs when you when you see it in the catalog. Um, extremely vibrant, extremely vivid case hardening on the frame. That's what stands out to you and stands out to me on this gun. Um, I go back to kind of a famous gun around here, which was... Uh, DFC 55104. It was on our TV show, and we did Ready Aim Sold. Um, that gun set a world record at the time for 160,000 when we sold it in 2010, 2011. Um, and then we were had the opportunity and the privilege to sell it again. Brought over 400,000 um, dollars. We we called that gun the finest cavalry in the world, and this gun is every bit it's it's equal and it's mate. It's hard to say one's better, one's one's less. The thing about it is, in 1880, 11 years later, 1890, 1891, bluing's different, case hardening's different. So we're cautious now to call anything the best in the world, the finest example known. We can say without fear of contradiction, this is the finest RAC gun there is. Every bit as good as that DFC, although different. Different case colors, uh, different bluing, more reds, more greens uh, later on, uh, 10, 11 years later, um, as, as, a, as opposed to more of that iridescence that you'd see early on in the 1880s. Um, but just <laughs> as good as it gets, again, investment quality, benchmark, a one-gun tour de force. You will find no better. Number two on my list. Ladies and gentlemen, number one on my list. I do always find the the the, the first one the, is the easiest one because I know I know what the best gun on the auction is in my opinion. My favorite gun on the auction is, and here it is, <laughs> the McClatchy Root. Um, this gun stands in extremely rarefied air, as we put in the catalog. It is a extremely well published gun, a well known gun, widely considered a best of the best for the model. It stands in rare company as a gun with a nickname. Guns with nicknames are good. It's simply known as the McClatchy Root. So taking it apart, and some people put a ton of value on the inscription. Some people don't put a ton of value on the inscriptions. This is a factory presentation. Sam Colt died essentially the first week of 1862, January 10th of 1862. Samuel Colt passes away. James McClatchy is the timekeeper of the Colt plant, more or less. And, I mean, Samuel Colt, if you, if you know, you know how instrumental, how amazing he was, what his contribution is to the American system of manufacturing, really the, the, the first industrial tycoon, and what does that mean? You think of Coltsville and what he built and what the factory built and the time and the place in, in history right, right at the beginning of the American Civil War and everything that's happening. And here you have James McClatchy, who is who is running the time clock, and you just can't, something that big can't run without military precision. And so, while Colt was was harsh uh, from an employer, um, he was also extremely progressive. While they had a ten hour workday, he was the first to implement a, a, a one hour lunch. And so, James McClatchy was extremely instrumental in in that machine. Um, and you know, you look at look at Samuel Colt presents by R.L. Wilson. 
you know, that was that was one of his first books to say, let's identify these presentations by cult by the Colts factory. So a cult presentation of a cult is rarefied air. If you collect if you collect percussion colts, that is what you aspire to, especially in grave stuff. You want to own a Samuel Colt presentation, a factory presentation. So we have a factory presentation, compliments of uh, the Colt Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company to James McClatchy in 1864 upon his retirement. Now, just set that off to the side. Now let's talk about this gun uh, in the pantheon of extremely fine 19th century American percussion colts. So I, I think for me, this is my passion. I say in um, September, September of 2011, um, I went and saw the Al Cali collection at Heritage Auctions, and that auction kind of changed my outlook on on firearms. It changed my outlook on kind of life. What I what, seeing seeing that the quality of, of guns there, um, you don't get to see that, okay? And there was five or six of them that that absolutely stood out. Case in point, the Milliken Dragoon um, that we sold several years ago came out of the Alcali collection. The Black Beauty 1851 Navy came out of the Alcali collection. But these are guns that are factory engraved mint. They've always been the blue chips from, uh, for what we do, consider them the Mona Lisa's. They are the Da Vinci's. They are the Picasso's. They are the masterworks of what we collect if you're in fine 19th century American firearms collecting, the highest level. And that's, that's what we have here. You know, it, there might be a hundred of them in the world that are at that level, okay? And that is that is what we have here in in the McClatchy route. You have a gun that is more or less uh, ninety nine percent. It's mint, um, and it's not only it's not thin. It's bright. It's vivid. I wanna. I mean, again, the pictures speak louder than words. But like an investment grade firearms and extremely fine and historic guns, you get to ninety five percent for a condition level. And, you know, that's where you transition from a, a really good gun to a great gun. And then every every 1% you add above 95% separates the men from the boys, where you have a great gun and then an elite gun. The devil's always in the details on this stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Um, unfired. Look at the vividness of that high niter blue on the screws. Again, if I'm not getting it on the, on the camera, um, we'll get it in the stills, but it's the same thing on this side where you roll it in the light and you can see the vividness of that niter blue and the contrast um, of that, that, that darker blue um, on the frame cylinder. Deluxe checkered ivory grips, so delicate, so handsome, so beautiful. Um, this gun is all there and then some. Pound for pound, it's no doubt one of the best guns that we've ever sold. It's it it's definitely a consideration for the single finest uh, factory engraved 19th century percussion Colt, strictly for for condition. That's why I'm saying you almost have to separate uh, the history. The history history is what preserved it, um, but its preservation is what makes it so important. Um, and that's everything from. I mean, you look at the accessories again. I don't know if I'm if I'm doing these any justice. We'll roll them in the light, but you see that <laughs> high niter. You have a, you know a, a screwdriver tool that's 99%. You have a you have a mold presentation mold that high polish finish. You see it roll in the light. You see how perfect that is. Uh, presentation mold. Same thing with the flask. I mean, it's brilliance in all capital letters. So. It goes without saying again, it was it was easy for me to pick this as number one. Everything else is a crapshoot because this sale just oozes with quality, absolutely oozes with quality. Uh, but number one on my list, I'm, we're proud to present the McClatchy route.